The United States of America likes to pride itself as the epitome of truth and justice to both its inhabitants and the rest of the world. Over the years since its inception, there has been too much evidence that proves that even the great American way is as flawed and as biased as they come. The country was split between a Jim Crow South and the other half that would come to be known as the Union. The South favored the continued oppression and disfranchisement of people of color. On the other hand, the Union considered everyone to be somewhat equal, hence the Civil War. But this isn't about the war. It's about one of the most overt and brazen acts of evil ever perpetrated, which saw the death of a minor in a case that followed anything but due legal processes. It begs the question of how we continue to trust the criminal justice system, even when they show an abject lack of objectivity and prejudice to a particular sect. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we'll be looking into the case of 14-year-old George Steiny Jr., who is subjected to the electric chair for being of color in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Steinies were a black family that lived in a segregated mill town in South Carolina called Alcalu, which was split between the whites and blacks by railroad tracks. The family lived in a humble home but were forcibly ejected after their young son was accused and arrested for the murder of two white girls. Upon his trial, it took the court the entire cooking time of a packet of pasta to find George guilty and mete out the death penalty. For over seven decades, Steiny was considered a murderer by the state of South Carolina until a revaluation of his case in 2004. Multiple experts paired with the Northeastern University School of Law and pushed for a judicial review, which overturned Steiny's conviction in 2014. The ruling was that the 1944 trial was anything but fair on the accused, and his name was cleared. The harm had already been done, but was this closure for his family or George, perhaps? In March of 1944, two white girls in Jim Crow South named Mary Emma Thames and Betty June Binnaker didn't return home after a day out. The girls were aged 7 and 11, but their demise was more of murder than losing their way around town. Earlier, the two girls had ridden bicycles across the small town in search of flowers when they ran into George Steiny Jr. and Amy, his younger sister. Betty and Emma pushed over to ask the siblings if they could point them in the direction of some maypops, the yellow fruit from passion flower. The Steinies had no idea, so the girls went on their way, and that was the last time anyone reportedly saw the girls alive. Betty and Emma never returned from their trip that day, which prompted a bit of a conundrum in the white half of Alcalu. Several residents formed search parties to look for the little girl, one of which was Steiny's father. Nothing turned up until the next day when the bodies of both girls were found in a ditch. The bodies were examined by a certain Dr. Asbury Cecil Bozard, who noted that there wasn't a clear sign of struggle, but the girls appeared to have been violently murdered and died from multiple blows to the head. There was a hole in Emma Tame's head, which bore straight into her skull through the forehead, as well as a cut on her right brow measuring two inches in length. For Betty Binnaker, the condition was more or less the same. She'd suffered seven cranial blows, which shattered the back of her skull, as was discovered in later examinations. Dr. Bozard concluded that both girls' injuries were likely sustained from a round instrument about the size of the head of a hammer. Rumors started to rise in the wake of the girl's death, with one of the prominent ones being that Betty and Emma had called at the home of one of the popular families in the town on the same day they turned up dead. But police never followed up on this trial and no inquiries were made. But when word started to go around from a witness who saw the Steiny kids talking to Betty and Emma, law enforcement officers from Clarendon County swung into action. They showed up at the Steiny residence where George was promptly put in cuffs and led away. He was held in a small room where he was continuously interrogated for several hours with no witnesses, attorney, or family. 
After the police had had their fill of the interrogation, one of the law enforcement officers became a sort of figurehead on the case, named H.S. Newman. He put out a handwritten statement about how he arrested George Steine, who confessed to the murder and disclosed the location of the murder weapon, a 15-inch piece of metal which he hid in the ditch some six feet away from the girls' bicycle. Even after much pressing, Newman refused to give up the location of George's detainment. There were rumors that the boy had been lynched, and even his parents didn't know any better. Meanwhile, the time for his trial was drawing near. I just want to highlight that George was being tried because 14 was considered an age of responsibility at that time, and he was believed to be a perpetrator of a capital crime. One month after the girl's demise, the trial of George Steiny Jr. officially started in a courthouse in Clarendon County. The court appointed Charles Plowden as George's attorney, but they might as well not have bothered because Plowden was useless. For the duration of the trial, Plowden didn't present the jury with any evidence or call upon any witness to the stand. Nothing he did even scratched the surface of George's potential innocence. On the other end, the only evidence that was substantial enough to condemn Steiny was the confession the police had allegedly gotten out of him. Unsurprisingly, there were no records of George admitting to murdering Betty Binnaker and Emma Thames. Surely that was enough reason to suspect foul play, right? No. Of course not. Because, you know, the most accountable, original, and unbiased piece of information is word of mouth. From his arrest to his trial, George had been cut off from seeing his parents, who were also terrified of being assaulted by the white mob. Not only were they laying low, but they also couldn't show up for their son. So there's 14-year-old George, all by himself, with no one but 1,500 white strangers and an all-male, all-white jury, who found him guilty only 10 minutes into deliberation. George was convicted on grounds of first degree murder of Emma Thames and Betty Binnaker. He was refused an appeal by the court, not that his lawyer tried to push for one anyway. Two months later, he was sentenced to be killed by electrocution. Even though the white majority seemed to be having their way with George's case, there was some resistance to his eventual execution. Both black and white ministerial unions in South Carolina petitioned the then governor, Allen Johnson, to pursue clemency for Steiny on the grounds of age. At the same time, the governor's office was being berated with telegrams and letters appealing for mercy on behalf of George. But there was an overwhelming similarity among George's supporters which showed a rather disturbing truth. All the letters and petitions and telegraphs centered on every other thing but the basic grounds of fairness and Christian justice. Meaning, they all accepted that George was guilty of the charges levied against him. On the 16th of June, 1944, George Steiny Jr., who was held at the South Carolina State Penitentiary, Columbia, was led into the execution chamber. He was dressed in a loose-fitting jumpsuit with a Bible firmly lodged in his armpit. George was only 95 pounds and was too skinny for the electric chair, which was designed for adults. He couldn't fit in the chair, and the state electrician had a hard time adjusting an electrode into his leg. The mask was also too big for George, but at this point, everyone was just so desperate to get it over with. So they slapped it onto his face anyway. The assistant captain asked Tiny if he'd like to confess to the murder in his final words, to which the boy replied, no, sir. You don't want to say anything about what you did? The prison doctor rejoined. Steiny's reply was the same, no, sir. The switch was flipped, sending 2,400 volts cruising through George's teenage body. The mask was thrown off, revealing George's eyes, wide and teary. Saliva dripped uncontrollably from his mouth for all the witnesses to see. Two more jolts were administered, and George's earthly troubles were gone with the wind. His death was confirmed shortly afterward, and in just about 83 days, George Steiny Jr. had gone from a boy enjoying the afternoon with his sister to a murderer who is tried, sentenced, and executed by the state of South Carolina. If there's anything we know about the truth, it's that it doesn't always stay unknown. The speed with which Steiny was convicted, as well as his mode of arrest and subsequent lack of evidence at his trial, is proof that a young black child railroaded for sins he didn't commit by an all-white justice system desperate to pin the crime on someone. And 
even if the case ever made it to light again, any worthwhile evidence was all but gone and many witnesses were dead. But decades later, in 2004, Steve McKenzie and Matt Burgess, both local attorneys, caught wind of George Steiny's case. It piqued their interest how irregular the entire ordeal played out. Post and Courier featured an article in which Burgess pondered the likelihood of Steiny committing such a crime. He asked if it was possible for a teenager of George's build to beat two girls to death, who were roughly the same size as him, or how he mustered the strength to move the bodies into the ditch. An even more puzzling question is how a black child in the Jim Crow South could commit such a crime brazenly against two white girls during daytime without drawing some attention. A new court hearing began for Steiny's case in 2004, and new evidence was uncovered, including testimonies from George's siblings who were with him during the time of Betty and Emma's murders. His siblings claimed that the police had coerced a confession out of George even though he had an alibi. After the girls rode away from the Steiny kids, George remained with his sister Amy, watching after the family's cattle. Additionally, an affidavit came from the Reverend Francis Batson, who had first noticed the girls lying dead in the ditch and pulled them out to land. Batson recalls in his statement that the ditch wasn't covered in blood, which suggests that the girls may have met their demise somewhere else before being dumped in the ditch. Another alibi came in the form of Wilford Johnny Hunter, who was a cellmate of George's during the incarceration. Hunter claims that Steiny denied the murder of the girls over and over, each time saying, Johnny, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Why would they kill me for something I didn't do? In December 2014, about 70 years after Steiny was executed, Carmen Tavis Mullen, a South Carolina judge, vacated the conviction levied against George Steiny Jr. after undeniable evidence from Burgess. Judge Mullen remarked that George's execution was rife with fundamental constitutional violations of due process and deemed the death penalty a great and fundamental injustice. None other than George Steiny's surviving siblings were ecstatic to hear of their brother's exoneration decades later. They thanked their stars for living long enough to have true justice. Catherine Robinson, George's sister, proclaimed that it was like a cloud just moved away. Dr. Amanda Salas, a forensic psychiatrist, reported on CBS News that the confession obtained through coercion was unreliable and a complaint false confession by a significant degree of psychiatric certainty. Following the overturning of the 70-year-old case in the town of Alcalu, South Carolina, the Post and Courier Exposé reported an interesting story. There was a long-standing rumor that the actual perpetrator of the crime was a certain 26-year-old George Burke Jr. Unlike the convicted George Steiny, Burke was white and came from an influential family, whose patriarch owned the land which Reverend Batson discovered the girls' body. Burke Jr.'s father, Burke Sr., owned the local lumber company that employed Steiny's father, who was subsequently fired as the case unfolded. Burke Sr. was also the organizer of the search party that led to the girls' discovery, but that wasn't too suspicious to be a coincidence for the police obviously. Burke Sr. also went on to play foreman on the coroner's inquest jury, which recommended Steiny's conviction on the grounds of murder. But that's not all. The grand jury, which decided on George's fate in 10 minutes, was also spearheaded by, I bet you wouldn't guess it, George Burke Sr. Burke Jr. took a trip to hell three years after the case due to complications of chronic kidney disease. He allegedly owned up to murdering the girls on his deathbed, but the Burke family seemingly denied the rumors. Even though George Steiny Jr.'s death was nearly 80 years ago, the prejudice against black people still echoes even now. But those are stories for another time. Today's all about the case of George Steiny Jr. and how he was betrayed and ignored by the system. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of George Steiny Jr. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.